What happens when a thousand oil cans decide to fly? That was a question asked at a public art installation called Jugad. Uh, this is a freestanding shade canopy spread over 70 square meters created from 945 discarded oil cans by 90 villagers outside Delhi over a period of three months. They say art imitates life and in India life's a hack. We move from one hack to another with no conscious thought as we try and cope with our infrastructure and our systems which aren't always keeping pace with our needs and desires. Many of you have heard my rants on Twitter and at my blog as things don't work as they should. I'd go as far as to say that hacking is in fact an organizing principle for life in India, requiring rapid adaptation, creativity and often some guile. So where does this come from, you know, this almost innate Indian style innovation, often called Jugad, not to be mistaken for the art installation that I showed you earlier. While it's quite the nom de jour among innovation and design experts and ethnographers, historically, it really is, in the words of Aditya Dev Sood, just a coping strategy born out of a lack of options or limited resources. People are forced to organize their lives around these improvisations, as aspirations and dreams are often in dissonance with infrastructure and service networks. It is about ingenuity in the face of adversity. It is about finding solutions. Now, I'm not really going to talk about pedal powered washing machines or diesel generator powered vehicles. I want to focus on a much more personal dimension of India's almost innate hacking culture. I'm going to introduce you to some people I've recently met in our research projects. These are people who are shaping India's future. In sharing, I want to stimulate you to think differently in terms of how we might approach hacking as a generative and novel construct, hacking life and living, rather than it being just about technology or infrastructure. Raghu is a small laundry owner. He's a guy who works very hard from 6 a.m. in the morning to 10 p.m. at night and does this seven days a week without a break. He doesn't want his kids to be in this business. Today, his livelihood is under threat from the big laundromats. How can Raghu compete with them? As a business, service is now key for him. He'll grab at anything that enables him to deliver on service, speed or personalization. How can cheap technologies help Raghu hack large businesses and make more money? Sachin has big dreams. He's come from the village, a farmer's son, and he lives in Be Belgaum, which is a tier three town. Uh, he's on his way to Bangalore. He's given up many things to place himself in a new environment that opens up opportunities. He now wants the city to come to him. So how does he hack that? He feels this will happen by networking. We've all met him. He's the kind of guy who's willing to friend you anywhere, strike up a chat on Yahoo or Facebook. Uh, he goes orcuting uh, uh, all the time. He sends you high fives. He's the first to exchange business cards with you at an event. Many of India's cities are made up of migrants like Sachin. Whether it's the vegetable vendors, flower sellers, rickshawalas, painters, errand boys, or executives like him, they all have big dreams. How can we help them hack into their networks? And how, how does all this help them hack into a bigger persona and a bigger sense of self? Linked to hacking money is the notion of hacking the system. It's an attitude here. You'd be seen as stupid if you paid for original music or movies or software. You must have heard of the missed call syndrome where the ring is the communication. Kids download movies, music, videos using really cheap or free nighttime connectivity and share with their friends. CDs? DRM? They don't know what these things are. So consider hacking free. Where could hacking free accelerate progress? Consider the collective in hacking free, the power of many. This is Nilakshi. She works at an interior des design training office and is allowed free classes as a result. She comes from a lower middle class family and has limited money and access. How does she make up for that? She's looking to expand her knowledge and uses her creativity to give her an edge. 
She doesn't have a PC. Money is really tight. And yet she spends it all on buying a smartphone for herself because she believes it will change her world. For instance, she uses her mobile phone to access the internet and download pictures for class assignments. She adds interesting frames to her pictures using some applications that she's downloaded. Or she uses the dictionary to learn new words. In the process, she gains respect and sometimes resistance too. And she's able to delay her marriage. The hacks on her device give her power and presence beyond apparent means. Manisha is a maid servant. She works at four homes seven days a week. She cleans, she sweeps and swabs floors on all fours, cooks and gives massages to her memsabs and their babies. Uh, not long ago, she got a cell phone and it changed her world. Most often it has no prepaid balance, she's out of money, but she receives calls. She uses speed dial buttons for her sons and daughters, which she has memorized. Ever since she got her phone, she started dressing smarter. She now carries a purse instead of a plastic bag. She says it all makes her feel like a working woman and not a maid servant. Is the phone also hacking her? Can you imagine living in a three bedroom house with two brothers, your in-laws, your own young family, where your husband's young unmarried brothers and their parents all share one bedroom and you're given use of the living room for your husband, yourself and your kids? So meet Ritu. She's a young bride. She's got a crying need for her own space, which she's constantly negotiating in her new home. In India, nothing is really personal. Also think of Ritu's young brother-in-law Pankaj who's sharing a room with his sibling and parents and still manages to flirt with his girlfriend on his GPRS enabled phone via Facebook chat. Now neither Ritu nor Pankaj wish to use the common PC at home as it is too public. So next time you pull out your mobile think about how it or you have used it to hack intimacy, claim a private moment or bring someone closer to you. Then rethink life experiences and how we're hacking them as a result. In sharing these little stories, uh, new issues and questions begin to emerge. Some that have occurred to us. What new publics can it bring into the technology fold? What new behaviors does it enable? What new needs and desires are being stoked? How do these people manage both the private and the public or collective that they belong to? How does technology anchor into this way of organizing life? And finally, what happens when hacking becomes very personal, just about me, my life and my money? How will you help me hack my future? As we often say in India, one step, no hack at a time. Thanks for listening.